Hi team, welcome to episode seven of the Lions Den podcast. Uh, we're very lucky to have England and Saracens George Cruz with us today to talk about his rugby journey and uh, where that journey is going to take him. So, hi George, how's it going? Good, thank you. Cheers for having me on. How are you? No, pleasure, mate. Uh, yeah, really, really good. Struggling to uh, to stay motivated when the weather's like this. I actually went out and did a bit of a, a workout in the rain earlier, but it's nowhere near as good as it was a couple of weeks ago with that sun out. Yeah, I've still got my run to do, so uh, I'm hoping it stops raining, but it'll be all right. Nice. What, what run have you got to do? Is that Who's that set by at the moment? Where does that stand in terms of, of where you're going? Are you still getting information from Saracens or is this something you do on your own? Yeah, so we're what two and a half months into into lockdown, so um, kind of coming through through the end of it, we hope. But I'm I'm trying to get kind of four runs or four bits of kind of cardio a week, whether it's two main runs and then like a some change of direction stuff, or or maybe an off feet or a, or a bike or something like that. Um, so just trying to keep my fitness topped up, really. So I'll be doing some probably some shuttle based stuff today, some some straight line stuff. So nothing too too crazy, but just more of a, a volume day. Um, we had, we're lucky to have um, some other Premiership players on on the pod recently, and they talk, everyone talks about the uh, the Bronco. Not not that they, they hold it in the highest regard. Are, are you having to do that at the moment as well, or are you just training? Sometimes I do it for. Well, I haven't really done it too much in, in my life, I guess. But I'd say uh, in lockdown, I've done it a couple of times. But yeah, it's mainly we do stuff like Malcolm's, which are probably shorter, um, more appropriate for maybe a front five forward. Um, so yeah. start on your chest, go 10 metres, go back 20 metres, hit your chest and then back to the original uh, ten, well, original start line, which is another 10 metres. So probably a bit shorter, shorter movements, kind of more appropriate for us front five doing down ups um, and, and not doing the the kind of 60 metre run in it that, that's involved in a, in a Bronco. Of course. So how does that, does, is that one of your testing? Is that one of the things you get tested for at club, uh, Malcolm, under time? Um, we actually don't get tested at club. I think it's it's just, we've just got a buy-in that we'll come back in decent enough shape. Uh, I think if you enter the club as a new person, you, you'll get tested for your heart rate monitors uh, in terms yeah. of like how you know how much you need a maximal test, and majority of that's probably going to be a, a bleep test or something along those lines. But yeah, we we don't actually have that fear of, uh, of 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 that first day back having a test because I think in most cases it's probably counterproductive. I think the first day if you come back from not doing you know proper training for five weeks from an off season and you go straight into a, a maximal test it's a it's it's a counterproductive thing in, in our view i think um you know most people will end up pulling a car for something so i think we're, we'd like to build a couple of weeks and then uh, and then do some sort of a test but ultimately i think if you if you come back in you know poor shape then you just you you'll do one more day a week than everyone else until you're in the right shape so i think there's an understanding that you you know you you come back in the right shape i suppose that, and everyone talks a lot about the the uh the culture at saracens is is that something then do you think is that culture in itself enough to to make you want to work hard and not let your mates down when you get back basically yeah, I think so. Like, there's a clear distinction if you've done completely nothing or you've at least done some sort of prep. So if we have five weeks off, I think the the standard thing is to you know let completely loose for for three weeks, um, start to start to get back into training for uh, the the fourth week, and then you know have a have a decent enough training week for the fifth week. So then you come back in you know in some sort of shape. If I guess if you did five weeks off with nothing, then I don't know, I'd lose weight and become fat. <laughs> so I'd lose muscle and, and become, uh, yeah, like I said, my skin folds would go up. Because I've been actually speaking to a lot of parents recently in terms of, because I suppose the hard thing to know what we're going through about at the moment is actually how much damage mentally all this being indoors is is doing to people. And I suppose actually coming back to not having the testings on, on on that day if you have if people have been struggling anyway and then just trying to stay fit as soon as you come back then you find you're out of rugby for six weeks another six weeks that's going to not just play havoc on your physical condition but a lot of it on your mental condition in professional rugby especially and i mean to, to be honest whenever you want to try aspire to be doing something good i think it 
it's a tough it's a tough ask if you if you you know if you've been waiting a long time and then get injured it's like it's like uh, I've been injured before and I've you know worked really hard to come back maybe for an international or or for for any game to be honest uh, and then I've got injured again so I, I had an op- operation in my ankle in 2017 worked really hard to get back for the Six Nations and then the day before the Six Nations opener or the two days before Six Nations opener I, I blew my knee out as well so but to, to back to back injuries is, is obviously quite quite mentally uh, testing but yeah ultimately if you've you know if you've like you say you've been in lockdown and then you come out and get injured obviously that's gonna um, it's gonna be a tough one to take than if you were just if you played majority of the season yeah and and how do you, how did you cope um, both I suppose mentally and then what did you do to get yourself back to fitness physically after those injuries? Tough one, really. I think making sure you got something outside of what you're doing is pretty key. So I've got uh, a business outside of rugby, uh, so I could put a bit of time into that sort of stuff, which is which is pretty key because otherwise you're just sitting and stewing about you know not being with the team and um, and, and those sort of bits. So I'd, I'd definitely say that, and then also just just adjusting your goals for that year in terms of look if you wanted to play uh, you know a certain amount of games or a certain level of level of uh, game that year, then you just got to be kind of really realistic and kind of set more short-term goals so like you know I've got to get back walking by this point I've got to reach this certain goal weight or reach lifting this or the you know testing in a in a running in a running test at this point so just shorten up your goals I'd say instead of having them like more long term yeah tighten them up a bit and be a bit more realistic that's good and then is there a lot you do now um, after those injuries to try and counteract that? Because, you know, if you go to a physio or a doctor, they're always telling you, uh, you know, prevention's better than the cure. Yeah, there's there's a big emphasis in um, in making sure that you're doing your, like your prehab and, and making sure you're warming up, you're cooling down. That's all, that's all quite important. Um, and, and it definitely does, especially the older you get, make a, make a difference. You start to understand your body more and more, uh, in terms of, you know, where you need to top up on. So for me, uh, if I don't do regular core and making sure that my, uh, you know, my, my glutes are switched on the whole time, if I don't do that, then I know my back will start playing up. Whereas if I do do it, then I'm, 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 you know, quite confident that, that I'll be all right. So it's a, it's, it's just making sure that, you, you know, you realise what your body needs and, and putting a plan in place to, to, to allow you to do whatever you want to do. And how long did it take you to realise those things and, and, and understand what is, is right for you and what works for you? Yeah. I think I think it's something which is, which is always, you know, you're always growing that awareness, um, especially the older you get. But I think definitely, maybe definitely two or three years before I was starting to understand, you know, what was, what, what were my weak points in my body, but then also the, you know, the discipline to make sure that I had to consistently do it because you might do it for three months and then come off, but then realise that actually that's the reason why I've now got injured. So yeah, it's a bit of a um, bit of back and forth in terms of realising what what actually your body needs. And, and how much of that comes around, you know, you said with the prehab, which is basically a, a, a facet of um, strength and conditioning. Um, how much goes into your programming through strength and conditioning? And, and when did you start doing that as a young rugby player? Yeah, I was quite late, I'd say. So I went straight from school and I had been playing rugby at a local club at Dorking. Uh, I'd also been playing at school. So I was, I was like doubling up in terms of games and bits like that on a weekend, which is quite testing. But in terms of like weight training and things like that and pre rehab, and I'd say I was pretty behind the curve in that. Like a lot of players had, you know, had been doing EDPG, which is like the pre academy, really. You know, they'd be doing that on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and sometimes in, in half terms and bits so I, I, I definitely hadn't done all that so I probably probably needed needed to do that a bit more when I was when I first came into the academy at 18 um, so I had a full year of basically not really playing too much but doing a lot of weights training a lot of fitness a lot of kind of balance and coordination bits like if it could have been different maybe I would have done a bit like I would have been involved in other places which would have pushed me to do a, a bit more of like the balance the core um you know coordination stuff and, and and looking at the the techniques of weight training to then come in when i was 18 to that so then i'd at least be prepared to then start properly uh you know properly training but i guess 
I had to really start a bit from scratch, I guess, uh, when I when I came in, which I guess was was fine for me, uh, and that's kind of what I needed at the time. Yeah, I think it's, it's in my opinion, it's like anything, isn't it? The sooner you learn a skill, you're you're going to be better at it, and whether that's yes. um, learning how to pa- pass and catch a rugby ball, or whether that's how to move your body well. And I think that's where a lot of things have, have changed now around um, youth sports is not just focusing, and I know football's a big thing for this, but not just focusing on, oh, if I just play the game, I'm going to get better at it, but actually I need to be able to move well so I don't get injured, so then I can play the game for longer for better. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, If you look at it as like a, at a, at a full length of a career, then yeah, you, you're going to be a lot better off if you've you know invested the time into doing, you know, a lot of the injury prevention stuff that you talk about. Cool. Um, just wanted to have a bit of a, a chat, really, about your your rugby journey. You talked a little bit about you know going from from Dorking. You were at St John's, did you say? Yeah. Before as well. What, what was what was that like going from from there straight into Saracens at, at the uh, what was that eight? At, you were seventeen, eighteen, were you? Yeah, eighteen. Yeah. yeah. It was it was tough. It was a, a big eye opener. Body wise, I'd probably un, you know underdeveloped in terms of I was very tall and skinny, but you know there wasn't much on me, uh, so I, I definitely had to uh, improve in that sense. Um, and for me, I was you know we were a split academy then, so split academy and first team, so that worked out really well for me because it allowed me to kind of spend all my time basically on my body rather than uh, trying to you know compete with first team players, I guess. But maybe some some of the academy guys who were ready to, to compete with first team members um, probably might have been a drawback for them. So it's, it was it's all individual, but yeah, it was it was tough. It was tough. It was a good realisation of, um, you know, how hard you had to, to get to train to, to, to be where you wanted to be, really. Yeah, and, and and what was the the thing that got you into to rugby? I suppose, and who were the um, influential people along along the journey? Uh, I'd say probably my, my brother was the one. He, he went to Dorking when what, he was about eight or something, and then I guess I I kind of followed him down, and I think he started to progress, you know, quite well. We played for for county and bits like that. So obviously, there's a lot of competition within within the household and stuff. So um, I, I probably just took it a bit too far, really. Uh, it's good. And what 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 do you think it was behind? So speaking to um, Amy Wilson Hardy, uh, who's uh, plays that was England sevens, and she was saying that the big motivation behind her making it into the uh, to play for England in both disciplines was behind a, a coach saying that she wasn't going to be able to do it. So that was a big motivating factor um, behind that. Have you got anything like that, or what would you say your motivation is? My main one would be kind of just just trying to be as good as I can be at something, you know, uh, and that's probably driven by, I, I think, probably trying to make my, my family and friends proud. And um, I guess if you, you know, if you work hard and you get into good teams and, you you know, you've got chances of winning uh, trophies and, and, and making some, some good memories. So for me, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a combination of just trying to be the best I can be, but also, you know, understanding that, you know, there's some pretty good crack to be had if you, you know, if you're, if, if you're at the upper end of, of the elite level. So, yeah, it's about trying to trying to be the best I can be, what and and still enjoy and make as many memories as I can. That sounds great. I imagine. Oh, I can't. Well, I suppose I can't imagine what it's like to be in a uh, uh, an environment like um, the one at Saracens. Because I imagine you've you touched on it briefly there with you know winning, and then that winning becomes you know infectious and, and contagious, and the, mm-hmm. then it becomes one of these things that you just keep doing but then there's lots of you, you mentioned as well before about having fun too and mm. Saracen has been to lead the way in in that side within premiership uh, yeah. rugby what what do, what do they what happens behind the scenes um, in terms of the fun stuff and I, we see it all over the the press when when <laughs> with with Alex Good and his bum bag but what's the you know what's it like to be in that there's a good culture of kind of working hard and then, you know, having a good crack off the back of it. You know, there's a, there's a few trips dashed in every now and then. Um, you know, so like I said, I've been extremely fortunate to be part of a team that's that's won some good bits, but also uh, 
you know, I've managed to see a fair few places through the, the trips we've been on and, uh, and, and they both equal a lot of memories are kind of different memories, I guess, in terms of on field and off field memories, but equally, uh, they're, they're both my, my most cherished ones, to be honest. Yeah. What would you say if you had to give one for either of those on and off field, would you say the, uh, the most memorable moments were? I enjoyed the Leinster final last year. Uh, obviously, we went down to what was, a, you know, pretty much an international Irish team. You know, we went down 10-3 uh, with a sin binning and with one of our, our main players going off and then managed to, to win, I think, 20, 21-10 or something. So, like, that was that was big. I uh, really enjoyed that. But then also, I guess, off-field, uh, uh, there'd be too many to, to pick, pick one off-field, but... <laughs> The, the team building ones at high altitude in the in the Alps was a was a good one. Fair enough. Um, we've got a few questions from a couple of people. One's from Nick, who uh, who was actually athlete of of the month this month um, on our Foundation Strength Online. And I, I think we briefly touched through it earlier, but he said, "What's the most emotionally challenging uh, thing you faced while on the rugby pitch?" And how did you deal with it? Like, there's lots of times where you pick up niggles, or um, you know, I had a broken cheekbone where you, you just, there's a there's a necessity at the time for, for I guess you to carry on because of maybe people who have gone off or things like that. So there's lots of times where on an injury front, like you know, you, you just got to crack on. Uh, I think that they tend to be the, the tougher ones, especially if they're you know ones which are pretty sensitive. Uh, and then I guess the other one is you know if you if you're performing particularly badly or you or you mucked up something. So in in one of the finals, I, I dropped a, a kickoff which led to a try. Uh, you know, quite early doors, but it's it was about just getting over that pretty much immediately because if you I guess if you hold on to it, then you're you know you're you're, you're letting your team down by making more mistakes. So I, I definitely think that like the discipline to, you know, to put things behind you is, is, is definitely a skill that can be learned. Uh, but on the flip side, if you, you know, if you hang on to it too long, then it can, it can drag you down. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, and how does you or through the training you've done at club or country, um, yeah. how, how, how do they prepare you for that? Or is that something that you've got to do yourself when it just happens within training? Uh, that's it's a that's a, probably more of a like a squad question. I think in terms of uh, there has to be understanding of your teammates as about the scenario you're in. You know, you don't want you don't necessarily want people shouting off you if it's just a you know if it was just a, an error. But if it was something that's you know come from the back of not working hard enough, then that's probably you know something which is shoutable. Um, so it's a it's a case of uh, an understanding of you know how it's come about. And yeah, it's just, it's like you can practice it in training. Obviously, if you get something wrong then, then they're just trying to park it and move on. But uh, ultimately, it, it's probably something that grows with experience. Um, and, you know, sometimes just be, just having a, a realistic point of view, you know, it's not, no one's, no one's uh, died from it. So it's, you know, it's just move on, really. Is, it, is, that, uh, is there a specific thing you say within the club? Because I, I remember two that stick out in my mind over the time that we've been, that I've, I've played and it was like the most one that everyone normally says is like next job but we did have a coach at one point who used to say it was like it was the something bubble and you just had to pop every time it happened you just had to pop the bubble and then yeah. move on is there, is there anything that's out there as that or uh, no, I, I probably agree with you. The next, just next job mentality. You know, like you can break, you can break passages up of, of, of passages of play up now to, you know, and you know that the plays won't go on for more than a couple minutes apiece. So it's it's about um, just play to play, really, or just yeah, breaking it down and, and, and moving on with it. Okay, cool. Uh, moving on to the next question, uh, one of our coaches, James, talks about the. Uh, the famous kick that you, that you did in in the Six Nations, and um, basically says, what was the message like, or what was the the dressing room like from coaches after that? Was it supportive, yeah. or was it? Why did you do um, it? Uh, probably it was a, it was a jokey thing, I think. But I mean, it was it was an execution error rather than a yeah. a, a decision making error. <laughs> I, I got asked to stand up and explain explain it in front of the group and uh, talk about kind of you know why I decided to make the kick and I, and you know I, I put my point across. Uh, I got booed, but these things happen, you know. Got to stand up for yourself sometimes. Yeah, and also I think if you if you 
if it get you let that get you down within those games, you know, one time it's going to happen and you're going to pull it off, and it's like it's the, it's the whole zero or hero type thing, isn't it? Yeah, there's at no point should I be attempting that. Um, <laughs> I did then kick the week after as well, but um, yeah, look, I, I I should have parked that one. I, I'm, I'm, Eddie said he'd remove my left foot if I did it again, so I'll, I'll, I won't be doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair enough um, the last one I wanted to touch on so we had Anna Capeless on last week and she was telling me a story about when she uh, went over to Japan she played for a short period of time over in Japan and she said that she said every time she couldn't work it out every time that she was going to training they were pumping up balls and then every time they left training they deflated all the balls <laughs> So it's like, I don't know if you've ever come across that from anyone who's played over in Japan or, or um, anything else, that any other strange stories like that? No, I love it. <laughs> There's some stories I probably can't tell, but um, no, I, look, I thought it was an unbelievable place. I think that it's full of like really kind people, uh, very safe place, very clean place. Culture's very, very different. The food's very different. It's it's something that's massively intrigued me, and um, hence why I'll be I'll be going over there in in November to to have a have a little stint over there. Okay. Well, yeah, it was it was really great to to chat to you on the on the podcast. Thanks so much. I know how busy you are with the business and also staying fit and everything. So really appreciate you taking your time out to chat with us. And hopefully, some of the information that you've shared with parents and and players can be useful to help them, you know, potentially get, get to where you are now. Brilliant. No, thanks for having us on. Best of luck.